Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's still Thursday, the 10th of March. Now, in the UK, we plan to start vaccinating children aged 5 to 11 in April, although you must say it's a bit of a, a lacklustre declaration by the powers that be. In the States, of course, it's it's basically standard practice apart from florida which has well and truly broken step and florida is now basically recommending against vaccinating children so what we want to do in this video is look at the evidence what is the evidence for what the state of florida is saying now let's just start off with looking at this here so this is the uh, the declaration guidance on pediatric covid 19 vaccines and they're not saying don't do it but essentially they are saying don't do it based on current available data healthy children aged 5 to 17 may not benefit from receiving the currently available vaccines so what we're going to do is start having a look through some of the evidence that uh, the uh, the surgeon general in florida is is presenting and we should hopefully come to some sort of conclusion based on the evidence now um this is this is from uh, florida health healthiest state in the nation okay everyone wants to be that that's great now here's some of the things that they're saying uh, it is essential that healthcare practitioners review all data well th th this is just so patently true of course it is a big part of the problem here is that people have been agenda driven and not data driven we have to go by the data so there's nothing to disagree with at all there we're with what the surgeon generally is saying to evaluate risks and benefits unique to each patient so this is what i've been teaching my students to do ever since i've started teaching we need to assess plan implement and evaluate care for the individual patient we don't go and say well everyone on the ward will have a bed bath followed by an injection of course not it's got to be individualized to the patient so again nothing to disagree with what florida is saying here when determining what health healthcare services to provide, of course, and we must always do no harm. This is the fundamental axiom of healthcare. We must not harm the individual. It's not that we mustn't harm most people. We must plan the care for the individual and not harm the individual. So really pretty impossible to, to uh, disagree with these opening statements, really, <laughs> including the administration of COVID-19 vaccines. Well, of course, it has to include absolutely everything, of course. So the, the preamble all makes perfect sense. Moving on, um, these decisions should be made on an individual basis. They actually really spell this out. So again, nothing to disagree with. There's, uh, well, I was going to say there should be no healthcare provider in the world would disagree with this, but we have been using a one size fits all policy in terms of, of vaccination and uh, a lot of the management strategies. And it's just it goes against what i understand to be the best way to do healthcare. At risk of administering a covid 19 vaccine to healthy children may outweigh the benefits so they're not saying don't do it they are being cautious here but this is what it amounts to healthy children aged 5 to 17 may not benefit from receiving currently available covid 19 vaccines okay so they may not uh, children with underlying conditions are the best candidates for vaccines. So they are saying that children with underlying health conditions might still need a vaccination. Now, let's look at the evidence that's being presented here, because this is um, this is the key thing. And I've tried to break this down in, into the main things that they're saying. So the first one is uh, risks that may outweigh benefits among healthy children with no underlying comorbidities. So they're saying risks may out, outweigh the, uh, the, the the benefits for the individual child. And they say there's limited risk of severe illness due to COVID-19. So this is true. Uh, there is some risk, but it, it's uncommon. So th this, this takes us on to this first paper here that they are using. And it's New England Journal of Medicine. It's a recognised uh, peer-reviewed paper about the clinical trials. So let's see how they read it. And of course, it is very much about how you read these things. Um, you can't argue with the numbers, but you can highlight particular parts or you can sort of downplay particular parts. It's, it's hard to be objective about a whole paper, but we're going to try and do that nevertheless. 
Um, so evaluation of the BTA, that's the Pfizer COVID vaccine, for children aged 5 to 11, New England Journal of Medicine. Now, the key thing here is that this data was recorded in Delta times. And my argument is that we are not in, well, of course, we are not in Delta times now. We're in Omicron times. And this has really, in my view, really changed the risk-benefit analysis. So well, what I was, what I was uh, talking about six months a year ago is not what I'm talking about now. Of course, we've got to move with the evidence and we've got to move with the change. And the move from Delta to Omicron is a massive change for, for the good. It's a beneficial change in, in, in virtually every aspect. Although COVID-19 is generally milder in adults than children, direct quote from the paper, severe illness and long-term complications, including multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, can occur after primary uh, vaccination course. So they are pointing out that this, these are risks, but this is based on Delta times, not Omicron times. So the degree to which we can extrapolate this, I think the Florida authorities are right to question that. Can, can we extrapolate this? And carrying on with this paper here, um, two doses of uh, Pfizer vaccine or placebo. So th this, this, this was the clinical trial, basically, wasn't it? So some people got two doses of the Pfizer vaccine and other people got the placebo. Now, this is what you call an open label study. Now, an open label study is the exact opposite of a double blind study. It's not the best way to do research. So in a double blind study, the person getting the drug or the vaccine doesn't know they're getting it and the person giving it and the person assessing the results, n none of them know what they're getting. But in an open label study, everyone knows. So that does really kind of change the benefit of the balance of the placebo effect, really. But, but uh, that was what they did. Anyway, they end up with two groups that they can compare, which is... Um, it's a two-group comparison, that's for sure. Uh, they had uh, 2,268 children. Now, of course, this trial, we could, we, could, we could spend the next hour looking through this. It would be a bit boring because I think we've probably done it before. But obviously it showed vaccine efficacy, at least in the short term. Um, it showed relatively safe uh, vaccine profiles according to this data in the paper but and this is the argument that florida are making no cases of severe covid19 or multi-system inflammatory system in children were reported in this cohort uh, some of whom got the vaccine some of whom uh, got a placebo now the whole point of doing a trial where you've got the experimental group that's getting their vaccine or the drug and the placebo group is you're looking for differences between these groups and no cases were reported, no, 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 no severe cases or multi-system inflammatory system, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children were noted in, in the vaccine group. But there again, they weren't in the placebo group either. So the argument that the Florida authorities are making here is there's no difference between the two groups here. There's no difference because there was no severe cases of COVID or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children noted in either group. So if we are using that as, a, as, a, as an experiment in a control group, then we've got to say that there was no difference. So that does support um, the, the contention that the authorities in Florida are, are making from that, particular, from that particular aspect of uh, severe disease. Now, the next one is high prevalence of existing immunity amongst children is the next argument they're making. Um, and a lot of this comes from um, a lot. There's some good. There's a good uh, site here. I am going to unpack this a bit because it's a fiendishly complicated graph. But you can get one for overall there and uh, some some in age specified ranges there, which will probably take a minute to change. But I've got I've got the main points that I want to show you. In fact, I'll just show you that now on this uh, on this graphic. So. Here we have um, here we have the graphic from that site. Now this this is everyone. This this is adults, adults over sixty five, and children. Now there's lots and lots of different dots on on these on these. This is this is because what this site does is it collects studies from all over the United States, and the different studies show much different much differing weight, rates of antibodies in children representing the existing immunity. 
but we do see here that there's, there are clusters near the higher end now how the same country can well i suppose there's different geographical areas so it is conceivable but i tend to think that some of these are done badly and some are done better but we are seeing quite a lot of clusters in in the higher uh, immunity age range and that's the one for just children there and uh, this is the most recent data here where we are seeing and this is consistent with the uk data about 85 percent of children being already exposed but here we see all these different studies but we are seeing that however you interpret that precisely that children have got high levels of existing immunity and the reason that that is uh, so confused that graphic is it's from all over so these are the number of studies so like um california and blah, 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 state there excuse me <laughs> apologies if you live in that it's one of the new england states isn't it a anyway you can see that there's widely different amounts of studies being done in different states that's that's why that data looks a bit confusing and there's lots of data points but we can certainly conclude um as the florida authorities do that there is reasonable levels of uh immunity already in the population so um the immunity is there already so so that's the uh, national institutes of health uh, covid zero hub that we were looking at there uh, absence of data informing benefits of covid19 vaccination amongst children with existing immunity um is uh i don't think i've got that paper loaded up but it's another paper i've put obviously i should put the link there that's an actually actually that's a that's an fda link that one actually uh, so they're saying there's an absence of data informing benefit of COVID-19 vaccine amongst children with existing immunity. Now, the limited th 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 this is this is a major black hole in the data in the UK and the United States. Now we know from data that we looked at from California and New York that people that have had two doses of the vaccine are not as protected as people that have had natural immunity. We know that the natural immunity actually confers better immunity in terms of preventing uh, preventing symptomatic infection and in terms of preventing hospitalization the natural immunity was better than two doses of vaccine but that's only been published for california and new york why hasn't that been published for everywhere why hasn't that been published for the uk this is an essential comparison the person that's fully or triply vaccinated what is the difference in their protection against someone who is um, someone who's not been vaccinated but has had the natural infection and that study also showed that there was minimal if any benefit of vaccinating someone who had already had the infection they didn't really get any additional benefit from that so again i think i have to uh, agree academically with, with the uh with the, with the florida uh, the florida study here um so in clinical trials higher than anticipated ser serious events occurred amongst those receiving the covid19 vaccine now with this with this piece of uh, evidence th th this claim here from florida um if they'd actually referenced um this paper uh, before if they'd actually referenced that one they would have found some evidence for that some evidence for that but the way it's referenced, they actually don't give good evidence for that because this actually is only reference to this uh, FDA site that uh, talks about serious adverse events in general. It's not specific. Now, that's not to say the evidence isn't there, but it is to say that whoever wrote this paper made a really sloppy job of doing that referencing. Um, but let's look at it anyway. Um, so the severe side effects that they are concerned about death life-threatening side effects hospitalizations initial or prolonged disability or permanent damage congenital abnormality birth defects requiring intervention to prevent uh, preventing uh, requiring intervention to prevent uh, permanent uh, impairment or damage and other serious events now they are not giving any specific links between these serious adverse events this whole series of adverse events and uh, childhood vaccination it's rather linking to this to this generic site here so that was a weakness in uh, in, in the way that they referenced but carrying on what are other points are the florida authorities making what's this next one yeah um, they do take quite a lot of information from this which is a preprint 
Uh, but it is based on New York authorities, and it is based on, you probably won't be able to see that, but that says 852,000 uh, cases. It's based on huge case numbers. It's one of these um, um, analyses by the authorities that don't take a sample. They actually analyse everyone, so it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty good data, really. But anyway, reduce vaccine efficiency with Omicron, and this, this is the key thing. We, we know that the vaccines with Omicron have reduced efficacy and we get more breakthrough infection. Effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine amongst children aged 5 to 11 and 5 to 17 in New York after the emergence of the Omicron variant. And this is good because they are actually taking into account here uh, the Omicron variant has now arrived. Uh, which, to be quite honest, most other authorities around the world are not. So uh, good on New York for including that. New York State Department of Health. So, as we say, uh, uh, over 800,000 sample size here, taking the data from everyone, anonymised, of course. And it's December 13th, 2021 to January the 30th, 2022. Now, age um, 12 to 17 year olds, there was 852,000 of those fully vaccinated. And age 5 to 11 year olds, there was uh, 365,000 of those fully vaccinated. So these are huge numbers. This is likely to give us highly accurate uh, data. And it's in the Omicron era, which is where we are now. We're not interested so much in Delta information. The effectiveness against cases of... Uh, the, the effectiveness against cases, people getting infected and diagnosed, of a Pfizer vaccine declined, declined rapidly in children, particularly those aged 5 to 11. So we've got a rapid decline in vaccine uh, efficacy is that argument and, and um however the vaccination of children in 5 to 11 was um super, was protected against severe disease and is recommended so this paper actually does recommend vaccinating children because it does say it protects them against severe disease all being that uh, very that, that occurring very rarely so um a bit of bit of a mixed stage. It really depends which bit you look at there. Are, are you going to look at the bit where it says the vaccine efficacy declines quickly, which it does? Or are you going to say that children do get some protection against severe illness and death, or severe illness hospitalisation rather at least, um, which which they do? But it, how does that balance against the, the 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 risk of the vaccine? So this this paper here is saying that you're better to get vaccinated. The Florida authorities are saying you're, well, they're essentially saying you're better not to get vaccinated. Now, one particular risk that they highlight in the Florida paper, in the Florida data, risk of myocarditis due to the COVID-19 vaccine. And again, we've got that in, uh, that comes from, data here comes from this paper here, a journal of the American Medical Association, which looks at that particularly. And uh, quite a good data set there, December 20 to August 2021 is what that is looking at. So again, let's see how Florida is interpreting that. A uh, study of 1,626 cases of myocarditis. So these are people that actually had the heart inflammatory syndrome. Reporting rates within seven days after vaccination exceeded the expected rates. And we have looked at this before. We, we know there is an excess in heart inflammation after mRNA vaccines. And that's across multiple ages and, multiple, and both sexes. Um, highest after the second dose of vaccine, that we know. Now, in adolescent males aged 12 to 15 years, this is what they found. 70.7 cases of heart inflammation per million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So I can't tell you to, vac to vaccinate or not, of course, that's not my role, but I can report the data that says that the, the risk here was 70.7 was million doses, 70.7 .7 cases per million doses in adolescents aged 12 to 15. Uh, in adolescents age 16 to 17, it was higher, 105.9 cases of heart inflammation per million doses of the vaccine. And in young men aged 18 to 24, it was 52.4 uh, 
uh, per million doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 56 uh, per million doses of the Moderna vaccine. So we see the highest rate is in 16 to 17 year olds, although the rate is not insignificant by any means in 12 to 15 year olds. So that, 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 that is uh, an indication of the relative risk and Florida clearly going down on the side of the, the risk is greater than the benefit. Vaccine efficacy wanes rapidly. Now this is certainly true. Study conducted out of New York. Again, this is that same study we looked at. New York State Department, COVID vaccine efficacy declined 84%. Um, and this is in 5 to 11 year olds. So this is in children. This is specific to the age group. The, the, the efficacy declined 84%. That is, it went down from uh, 68% down to 12% over two months. Wow, that is a rapid decline. So that is a very good argument. And again, the evidence that the natural immunity has is, is got much better longevity is accumulating and getting, well, it is fairly strong already. So good, good point there from Florida, I must say. Health, healthy adolescents age 12 to 17. Uh, COVID vaccine efficacy declined 40% from 85 down to 51 over two months. So we see that particularly in children aged 5 to 11, very rapid decline in um, <clears throat> in vaccine uh, efficacy. Now, what they do state here is um, for children with underlying health conditions, it's a different situation. COVID-19 vaccine should be considered in consultation with your healthcare practitioner. Well, of course it should. Hopefully you can get to a good one. Of course it should, because it should be individualised. Parents are encouraged to discuss, discuss the risks and benefits. Well, that's what this is all about. It's a risk-benefit analysis. Uh, direct quote, in general, healthy children with no significant underlying health conditions under 16 years of age are at little to no risk of severe complications from COVID-19. For adolescents aged 16 to 7 years of age, the risk of myocarditis due to the COVID vaccine may outweigh the benefits. Pretty strong statement, really. So for adolescents aged 16 to 17 years of age, the risk of myocarditis due to COVID-19 vaccine may outweigh the benefits. They're not saying it definitely does, they're just saying may. So really, what they're saying here is they're kind of chucking it onto the healthcare provider, which um, you could say that's a bit of a cop-out, but, but you could also say this is absolutely correct because it's individualising care. There you go. Uh, I mean, in the UK, we're going to start vaccinating <coughs> um, um, five to 11 year olds uh, in April. Or, or they're saying it can be considered as a non-emergency measure. And they're also saying that this is to guide against uh, future, future variants. But we've seen that in five to 11 year olds, especially the vaccine efficacy declines really quickly. So why on earth would we want to vaccinate 5 to 11 year olds against a potential future variant which may or may not come? Because by the time it's come, it's the probability is that the vaccine efficacy will have waned potentially to the point of, of insignificance. So the UK strategy here doesn't really make sense. I think it really indicates the, the sort of vacillation that's going on in the United Kingdom. Uh, whereas in the United States, the advice is to vaccinate that age group, but uh, Florida has uh, has uh, well and truly broken ranks. So there you go. Um, I'm sorry if there's no as firm a conclusion as you'd want. Um, I, all I've done is try and present the argument for and against, and uh, I can't advise you what to do. But I think we can say that some of the Florida argument here is very good. And other parts of the Florida argument, uh, particularly there about uh, severe adverse events, is is weaker because, as we see, that just links through to the FDA uh, to the FDA site, whereas others, others of their links are pretty pretty good. That one going to work? Yeah, they they go it takes you through to the relevant paper. So va variable quality of referencing but making some interesting points. But the key thing I like about it is that they've changed their thinking 
because we're now in the age of Omicron. We need to leave Delta thinking behind because we no longer have Delta, or virtually none, tiny bits, but virtually none. So there you go, interesting news from Florida, and um, I'll leave that to you to mull over, and all the references and links are there if you want to look at it further. And uh, thank you for watching.